the questions will all be answered. Your presenter today is Michael Christian. And with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to Mike. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Michael Christian over here in Lake Mary, Florida. I'm the product manager for medium voltage apparatus, uh, presently uh, representing the indoor breakers and some of our newer technologies into the market, uh, diode switch one, the DS1. Um, but today I'll focus on our magnetically actuated type breaker technologies um, and its benefits in, into the marketplace, specifically focusing on the medium voltage uh, circuit breaker side. So in reference uh, to medium voltage and even high voltage circuit breakers, uh, the present ANSI and IEEE standards, uh, C37.04, is the standard that is presently utilized in the rating structures of the circuit breakers. C37.06, of course, is the preferred rating and required capabilities. Um, in ABB, we always meet the preferred ratings and required capabilities of all uh, our circuit breakers during testing. Um, and then the C37.09, which defines the type testing that is performed, how that testing is performed, and also additionally your production testing that is done to the product before it is shipped. So, you know, what is a basic, what is a medium voltage circuit breaker? You know, a, a basic circuit breaker by functionality is meant to break a fault um, under, you know, a large fault. Uh, that's its main purpose. It's, it's not usually designed to sit there and, and constantly do switching operations, which would be the definition of just a switching device. Um, so for the voltage ranges of both high voltage and medium voltage, they can range from 1 kV up to 100 kV. Uh, most common, you know, medium voltage vacuum circuit breakers that we see uh, will range in the 5, 8, 15, and 27, and even up to uh, 40 kV levels in even our IEC markets. So what is the basic structure, overall structure of, you know, the we have the circuit breaker. Um, throughout the years, you know, you have the different types of quelching mediums and you have different types of mechanisms. Um, and we'll look at the, talk about basic uh, where we were in the past with vacuum interrupters and FS6 and, and older technologies just to get a, a brief overview and then talk about the different mechanisms, um, specifically just focusing on the magnetic. For present market, uh, most people are utilizing a spring type or mechanical type mechanism which you know utilizes a charging motor opening closing coils and so when you when you talk about a magnetic actuated breaker um, all of those you know same ideas are in the design but we don't specifically have a charging motor or a specific open or closed coil as is defined in a spring type mechanism so the basic overview of say the magnetic actuator, here, here we've shown is the AMBAC circuit breaker. Um, but from uh, the basic standpoint of all our magnetic actuated type technologies is broken down as you see here before you, where you have your, your quelching medium, in this case is a vacuum interrupter um, utilizing vacuum technology. Then you have some sort of mechanical means that goes between the quelching medium and then the actuator itself. Um, and these are composed by the different components listed from your, your primary contacts through the quelching medium to your mechanical uh, connections and then to the, excuse me, the actuator itself. And we'll talk a little more about that in detail here in a moment. So in the past, uh, we've gone, we've seen a change, of course, in the market. And now the most prevalent uh, technology that's utilized is vacuum. We do see uh, a lot of FS6 still sold in medium voltage in the uh, global marketplace. Uh, but FS6 is primarily utilized in high voltage circuit breakers, especially your large outdoor circuit breakers. And even some of your you know, indoor switch gear utilizes FS6 as a quelching medium. Um, and, and in medium voltage, a lot of FS6 is may be used for two different reasons. Uh, one may be space uh, constraints where you need uh, to provide a larger uh, voltage range in a small space or 
uh, for certain type of capacitive switching applications, but we've seen in, in recent developments where vacuum technology has started to get to the point where it, it is providing a better capacitive switching ability, and I'll talk more about that here in a few moments. So just a brief history of vacuum technology. You know, tech, vacuum technology was, you know, researched in the early 1926 and has been, you know, slowly getting into market, not until, you know, the mid-90s, uh, where we've seen an increase in the technologies, not just in how, you know, we're able to put the vacuum into the interrupter itself, um, but also in the types of materials that we utilize in this interrupter and how those materials affect the operation of the breaker and affect the operations that we see in the circuit and getting into, you know, the capacitive switching of the breaker and its abilities. So vacuum interrupters, um, overall in the past, the original design life of most vacuum interrupters was thought to only be about 20 years. Uh, presently, the vacuum interrupters that we are offering uh, have a 30-year lifespan, a projected 30-year lifespan, not saying that they can't exceed that, um, and a 30,000 operational uh, life. Now, the 30,000 operational life is really uh, focused more on a circuit breaker type application. Uh, those, type, those number of operations can be well exceeded depending on uh, mechanism differences that you're utilizing to operate those vacuum interrupters. And a lot of this has to do with the construction of the vacuum interrupter and, and the forces that you utilize during the control of its operation. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. So the basic structure of a vacuum interrupter, you have a fixed contact, which is seen here on the bottom. And this fixed contact will, of course, stay still. And on the top, you have the movable contact. The movable contact is what actually uh, it causes your, your braking, excuse me, <coughs> your fault breaking during motion, during operation. Um, the movable contact, of course, has to stay perfectly straight during its, its motions up and down, which is why we added twist protection. The twist protection protects the metal bellows from uh, fractures that can be caused by rotational forces during the operation. Um, not all uh, circuit breakers are able to do a perfectly linear operation of the movable contact due to the design of the system. And this can cause microfractures into the vacuum bellows during the operation of the vacuum interrupter. You know, so also the, the speed at which you operate these vacuum interrupters can degrade its mechanical life. And that's where why we see the 30,000 operational range uh, in, say, circuit breakers. Uh, in order to exceed that, you know, we change the mechanism's parameters slightly so that the forces are less into the bellows, in which case the life of the vacuum uh, interrupter ex is extended. So during switching um, in a vacuum interrupter under fault, when the circuit breaker starts to, to do its operation, you get your mechanical contact separation you end up seeing an arc voltage generated between the separation of those contacts before you have your full short circuit current operation at current zero. This causes transient recovery voltage into your system, but also during that operation, those, uh, those little voltages during the separation uh, causes burning on the primary contacts. So we we mitigate this through different types of contact designs and materials. There are main two types of contact designs presently in the market, the TMF and the AMF mode type uh, contact system. Uh, at ABB, we of course are utilizing in our, our medium voltage circuit breakers, the TMF contacts in all our circuit breakers and even in our uh, uh, contactors. Um, the TMF type design allows for a small arc that actually rotates on the contact design and then extinguishes when it reaches a mechanical or physical break within the contact. This actually acts kind of like a, if you think of a lightning bolt during a storm, you know, lightning doesn't strike the same place twice normally. And when it does, it actually kind of translates around a little bit. It doesn't stay in one place. Well, during the, the operation in a TMF type contact vacuum interrupter, 
This allows for a little more evenly burning of the contact systems over time and operations. An AMF type uh, contact design doesn't give you, it gives you a very diffuse arc that covers the whole surface. And so this gives you a large thermal load and during the vaporization of the materials can actually cause, excuse me, seem to have a camp problem here, can cause um, uh, hills and valleys to develop due to redeposition of materials onto the contacts. So here's a little quicker, or excuse me, a little more in-depth overview of the TMF type uh, burning during a, an operation where you can actually see here's where the arc would develop and rotate around the, the, the uh, contacts. This allows for this arc to move around and burn the, the contacts evenly, but also gives it reduced thermal stresses onto the contact surfaces during operation, which gives you an increase in life. Um, most vacuum interrupters, and people always ask, you know, what is the life of my vacuum interrupter? And how can I project that life of the vacuum interrupter during normal operations, saying fault breaking or uh, load operations? Um, there's always, you, know, you can always ask for the VI life damage curve. And this curve uh, can be used to project how many operations that you can have at either breaking current or full, uh, full uh, <coughs> fault breaking current. And, or, and project that life, whether you see only half of the fault breaking that the break is, is uh, rated for or say you don't see any fault at all um, and then project when that you need to perform maintenance on that breaker. Uh, one of the ba main benefits of the TMF type contact spiral wear is the reduced uh, energy which is, uh, excuse me, gives you reduced contact wear and allows for more evenly burning of the contacts. So, and because of this, it, that and the combined with the materials of those contacts, your wear of those contacts will be less than one millimeter over the total life of that vacuum interrupter. So what we have here is just a, a good visual representation of what we read in, in the last slide and what I've been discussing here where we have the first contact is, is a brand new contact and then the second contact is after 30 full short circuit operations. This in comparison to an AMF contact which you can see here has these hills and valleys and this is one of the primary things that we talk about when people ask uh, in terms of do you have contact wear indicators. Uh, in, a lot of this shows that, you know, the contact wear doesn't really exceed a millimeter. And in the, in the uh, excuse me, photos below, there are these 50 kA contacts, which were, had performed a full series of anti short circuit test duties, were then pushed even further to the limit to have a destructive test done to them to see what the damage would occur to the contact surfaces. The overall changes in the, the big phase contact that you can see here is only 0.8 millimeters. Um, so to measure something that that small outside of the vacuum interrupter becomes extremely difficult, especially if you're doing it from some sort of visual indication where you have a small line. So for that reason, We do not offer contact wear indicator marks on our products. We do have some products that do have these, uh, but that's only because of a customer request to have that. But it gives you a false indication, a you know, a, for, a false sense of that of the health of the contact wear. The contact wear uh, should really be measured by looking at the the uh, integral of the current using a relay. Or if you cannot do that, you can actually then just perform a contact resistance test, do an AC withstand test to verify that you have vacuum integrity in the, con in the vacuum interrupters um, during maintenance. So additionally, we do compensate for the one millimeter of wear in the design of the uh, pull assembly. And so we'll talk here about pull assemblies. The 
embedded pull assembly is a very high reliable product that uh, ABB was the first in the market with and it has a high dielectric strength and this allows us to also keep the vacuum interrupter enclosed so that you don't get a buildup around the vacuum interrupter which could lead to voltage tracing or uh, due to contamination issues or even uh, things such as corrosion occurring onto the vacuum interrupter which could then degrade the metals of the vacuum interrupter and cause a vacuum leak over time. So the basic design of the pull assembly is you have your vacuum interrupter which is embedded into an injected uh, molded uh, process either in an epoxy resin or a thermoplastic type cast epoxy excuse me and so which affix the vacuum interrupter oops sorry which affix the vacuum interrupter in place so that you can move the movable stem below during your operations. Below your movable stem, you have your contact springs. Now, your contact springs have an extra four millimeters of travel, which, is, which compensates for the uh, one millimeter of wear of the contacts. These, these springs keep the correct amount of force on those contacts, even if they were to exceed two millimeters of wear, um, just in case, but they don't, of course. <laughs> Not very good. Most, um, most people ask about, can I remove and replace poles? And if I do, you know, what is, what is the process and is that done in the field? We don't recommend that this is done in the field. The construction of the poles are so, so accurate that the alignment of the poles is critical on to the breaker products on medium voltage indoor breakers. So this is usually done in a, in a controlled environment where you know we have precision uh, machines that can measure where the emplacement of the poles are and the adjustments that may be required during a fixing of the poles. And now on to the uh, medium voltage breaker itself. Uh, just a quick overview of the anti breaker that we offer, but uh, the magnetic technology is, you know, when I speak of it primarily, I speak of the AMVAC circuit breaker, uh, which we have that same technology utilized in many different other uh, devices that it was implemented to. The magnetic technology was originally designed for an outdoor type product. It was kind of an OVR type uh, pole product in the IEC market in the mid 90s and then was released into the US market in the early 2000s in some of our products, ABB, uh, our outdoor products such as an RMAG and the, M and the indoor product being the MVAC. Um, but all these te products utilize the same basic core technology, a magnetic actuator with a control card and capacitors for storage, and I'll talk a little further about that. So the, the core technology of a magnetic actuated breaker is the actuator itself. And, and in comparison to a spring charge type breaker, you know, people say, oh, can I monitor, ask, can I monitor the open and closed coils of the actuator itself? Well, that's actually not done in a sense because the coils are monitored by the control device, which I'll talk about in a moment. The main coils of the actuator do the physical motion of the operation. Um, they're not like a spring charge breaker where the coil is just flipping a switch, a mechanical switch, and that mechanical switch is releasing the energy from a stored spring. And instead, we're using the coils in the magnetic actuator to actually break down the magnetic forces of the permanent magnet that are keeping the breaker in the open or closed position. So during operation, this is a side view here of that magnetic actuator with the permanent magnets in the middle, the open coil on the top, closed coil on the bottom here, and this is at rest with no energy applied to either one of the coils. This is the magnetic flux density of the actuator. And to the top part here, you see in red, the higher forces of density. Now, to to the breaker sitting at rest in the open position because the armature is, is up to the top. To close the breaker in, energize the closed coil on the bottom, and you can see where it, it's created a larger 
magnetic flux density at the bottom, which then grabs the actuator, uh, actuator on the, which is sitting up at the top, pulls the actuator down to the bottom, and then the magnetic flux of the actuator, which has permanent magnets on it, combined with the magnetic flux of the closed coil and the magnetic flux of the two permanent magnets in between those that provide the latching, give that larger density flux on the bottom, and then the coil de-energizes, and you actually see the inverse of the first photo, and so the breaker will sit at rest in this position until the open coil is energized, and then the operation is performed in reverse. So that gives you the basic of the actuator itself, and this is one of the reasons why this, this actuator doesn't require any kind of greasing or lubrication because you cannot get into it. It is bolted together in place uh, using you know, not just the magnets but also the metal frame of the actuator, and, and because of this, there's, there's no way to get internally to that actuator. If you were to take an actuate, one of these actuators apart, the strength of the magnet is, are such that you would never be able to put the actuator back together without the proper tools. Um, but the actuator life itself is, is so great that it doesn't require any kind of maintenance or even kind of greasing because of the shims that are used internally for the lubrication. So the high reliability of that, you have no maintenance on this actuator, and you actually have no maintenance on the poles, of course, as I spoke previously, because you don't have any adjustments to the poles because they compensate for any wear. Um, then we get into the controller of the actuator itself, which is, in this case, the EV2 control board. Now, the EV2 control board is used also in conjunction with the same actuator that is used in all the different products that uh, I had shown previously. And these control boards come in two variants. Uh, we have a low voltage and a high voltage board. Um, when we say that, we're talking about the control voltage input only. Okay, so your, your control voltage that provides the charging of the breaker itself, not the input voltages that provide, you know, the opening and closing, because the, the input voltages range from 10 to 280 volts, no matter whether you have a low voltage card or a high voltage card. And this is because those inputs are simply optocoupler inputs. They only require a uh, 10 volts at 2 milliseconds, or I'm sorry, 6 milliseconds at 2 milliamps to provide an operation. It's just like you're turning on an LED because they're optocouplers. Um, also, for charging of the breaker, no matter what, whether you have the low or high voltage, it's still 100 watts. Uh, so normally at, a, say, a 125 EDC range, you know, that's only got about a 1 amp draw, which lasts for only seven seconds, a little left, uh, depending on whether you have one or two capacitors in the breaker, or if you have an R mag, which has multiple capacitors, then it'll be, then it'll be much greater than seven seconds. But once it reaches that full charge on those capacitors, the current draw drops down to 10 watts. This 10 watts maintains onboard self-diagnostics and testing internal, um, which I'll talk a little bit about in a moment. Additionally, there is a low power setting. Um, the low power setting we don't see used in indoor applications at all, uh, but uh, some outdoor applications, people will want to utilize this in extremely remote uh, stations. I haven't seen it, like I said, on the indoor. Uh, the, the power draw on the ED2 board is such that, that even a high voltage board, if the voltage drops below that 77 volts or 70 volts, it could still charge it with 48 volts. It will still try to convert that voltage to the energy it needs to perform an operation. Um, so it doesn't really have, it has an under voltage setting that causes a trip, but the board will not shut down because the voltage has dropped below a certain range until, until it's extremely low, excuse me. Pulse and tripping, um, like I said, the optocouplers, they're you know very low uh, settings. Uh, the voltage input can be raised from that 10 volt. There are jumpers on the input uh, card. We have an input filter card, which is there to utilize uh, to ensure that it doesn't have any false operation due to noise on the system. Uh, but some systems may be even have extreme noises or customers prefer, prefer to have a higher input voltage threshold. And some people might ask, well, why does your input 
threshold, you know, so low from 10 volts up to 280. Well, that's just required by the ANSI standard for magnetic actuated technology. Um, so we have the option to use that input threshold um, if needed. There, like I said, there's jumpers on the board that can be cut, or you can order a optional filter card, which would then raise the voltage input threshold to 70 volts. Additionally, there is an auxiliary and protection safe open feature. And then you have your control status indications, your outputs, which are dry contacts. And those dry contacts, there's a ready and not ready. Um, and these contacts give you the status internal to the, the breaker itself, which I'll speak about in just a moment. So the additional features that we have, the, you know, you have the ready, not ready output contacts. Uh, these do certain things that are, tell you that certain things are, are good with the breaker, so to speak. This provides the means of your coil monitoring. So instead of putting a, an actual device on the input for the open or close, which you would normally do on a spring charge type breaker, for the magnetic breakers, you just monitor the dry output contacts. The reason being, of course, those optocouplers, which utilize the small current draws, so you could actually cause an inadvertent trip or close if you tried to monitor the input itself using today's technology for relays and even you know indicating lights. Um, so these ready, uh, the ready contact actually tells you certain things. You have an on onboard watchdog timer which uh, monitors the process or operation, and if the processor has any kind of internal failure, uh, it will then signal that there has been a problem and cause, of course, your ready contact to open. It also ensures that your onboard circuitry, the IGBTs themselves, which these are the transistors that provide the energy flow from the capacitors to the open or closed coil for the operation. Um, also, the ED2 board has true coil monitoring, where it will literally, or it will, uh, excuse me, <coughs> every so often send a 1K hertz signal to the open or closed coils and measure the impedance of those coils. And then, of course, keep the ready contact closed if they're good or open it if it's open. Um, and then you have the voltage, which is on voltage and current to the storage capacitors. It checks for that. It also looks at the operational temperature internally. Um, if the uh, outdoor if the temperature in, inside the system starts to increase, the EV2 board will actually decrease the voltage that it keeps stored on the capacitors to prevent the capacitors from bulging as the, the inside of the equipment gets hot. And this would be for like an extreme type environment. Um, so also you have the safe open input, which is uh, what I was referring to earlier about the emergency type input. Uh, it's a completely separate circuit. And if the watchdog timer, you know, notices that there's a failure, this circuit will, will activate and it, get, it will bypass all the controls onto the ED2 board. And so when you send a signal saying, I need a safe open, I need to open immediately, that circuit will then take all the energy that is stored on the capacitors and dump all of it, 100% of it, into the open coil and, and force the operation. Um, during normal operations, the, the control board would only allow a 45 millisecond pulse of energy from the coils or from the uh, capacitors to the coils for an operation, giving the exact amount of energy that those coils need just to protect them and, and increase their life. Uh, we have actually never seen a failure of those coils in the field whatsoever. Um, additional features. Uh, more additional features is you have the open and closed position sensors. Um, these sensors tell the ED2 board, did the breaker reach open? Did the breaker reach fully closed? Um, so if someone sends a signal to the breaker to close and the breaker does not fully meet this within 95 milliseconds, it'll automatically force itself to open again just to ensure that it has the right contact pressure force and everything in a kinematic all the way to the vacuum interrupter. Uh, because you don't want to have a circuit breaker that may be partially closed, which could occur on a mechanical pipe breaker. Also, as I discussed before, the temperature shutdown feature is what I was referring to with the ED2 board, you know, lowering the voltage on the capacitors as temperature increases. Um, then we also have silicone form coating on the uh, ED2 board. This 
provides a protective means for shock, vibration, uh, corrosive environments. We see these uh, magnetic type uh, circuit breakers in ship to shore applications. We see them on board ships. We've seen them in coal environments. Um, and we've also have done extensive um, uh, shaker table testing for uh, seismic requirements. Previously, as I had mentioned from the input uh, side of things, the input filter card, which is on the AD2 board, um, this filter card has those jumpers that you can cut. When you cut the jumper, it raises it from that 10 volts input, uh, 30 volts more, so up to 40 volts. And then, you know, you can order the optional filter card to increase that threshold, but it'll increase it to 70 volts DC. Uh, we only see that ordered for mostly on 125 VDC applications, but it can be ordered for other DC applications, the, the 220 or even the 48 in some requirements. Um, then we have the usable selectable features. Uh, you have the energy failure auto trip. Now, this energy failure auto trip monitors the voltage on the capacitors. Like I said, the 82 is constantly doing checks, and one of the checks is, is there enough energy in the capacitors to perform an open operation? Uh, when the voltage drops below 49 volts in the capacitors, the uh, 82 board knows that that's the, the, lim uh, excuse me, the minimum amount of energy required to do an open operation. So if this switch is turned on, and that occurs, and and it can occur, say, if there was a failure in the power supply circuits, control line, whatever may have caused this failure, the ED2 board will then automatically in, uh, send a trip. And so this is a settable feature for customer use because you know, your application, you may want the breaker to stay closed, you may want the breaker to open uh, if there's a failure. So it, it's customer you know, requirements that drive that. Also, under voltage trip, this works exactly as you would say a uh, spring charge type breaker where you have a separate under voltage input. That voltage can be totally separate from your control input voltage. Um, so you would set this voltage by some dip switches that are actually on the filter card itself, but you can also set it for a specific time delay from half a second to one second all the way up to five seconds. Or you, like, or you can leave it off, in which case, you know, the breaker would stay uh, in whatever, in the, excuse me, in the closed position. Um, also, there's another switch where you can have it called uh, block breaker closed or block breaker open, excuse me. Which, if you're under voltage, um, if you have this switch set on, and say you send a signal to a breaker, and you have the under voltage set on. And you can have the breaker either do a close open or you can have the breaker stay in the open position just by a certain uh, switch setting on the board. All of these are, of course, shown in the instruction manuals of all the uh, associated products. So further, a little more uh, talk about the actuator itself. Um, and a lot of people say, you know, you know what's going to happen in, with the actuator magnet? Uh, the magnet is, of course, will outlive the breaker. They'll outlive uh, me. So you won't have any concerns as far as the uh, magnetic life of the, act, of the rare earth magnets that are utilized in magnetic technology. And then the life of the capacitors. The life of the capacitors, of course, is projected at 25 years. All electrolytic capacitor manufacturers recommend a 15-year replacement in hot, like, say, uh, jungle environments or 20-year replacement in normal uh, ap uh, applications. Um, that doesn't mean that the capacitors won't exceed that. It's just what they recommend. Uh, by calculation, you can project the life of your capacitors. Um, this right here before you is the calculations utilized on the present indoor uh, product line, the AMVAC, uh, which shows a 25-year replacement. Um, some people ask, you know, well, how do I monitor that? Uh, you know, your control board does tell you if there's something wrong, but, you know, you may want to do maintenance, say, after every five years and measure the capacitance on the capacitor. One good indication when to, that you need to check, start checking the capacitance of the capacitor is if you were to pull off the yellow cap, which is on top of it, and simply inspect the top. On, on the top of electrolytic capacitors, there's a little vent 
and that vent will start to open at a certain point of the life of the capacitor and provide venting of it. This is normal, um, and in an indoor environment, you would usually see venting about in the eight-year time range, at which case that would be the time that you really should start monitoring the capacitance of a capacitor in its life, and then you can project when to replace that capacitor. The benefits of a magnetic technology breaker is it's, it's very few components. It doesn't require maintenance uh, of the mechanism. The, the, the only thing that you're going to really monitor over the life of the breaker is the storage capacitors, as I was just referring to. Whereas a spring charge breaker, <coughs> you're going to have to inspect it thoroughly. You, you may have to clean it depending on your environment. You may have to you know, do some lubrication. Um, all things such as charging motors and coils that may need to be replaced, whereas with the magnetic technology, you're not going to replace those coils, you're not going to replace that actuator, you, you physically cannot um, do it in a, any normal environment, and it's designed to never be replaced for the life of the product. Um, also, you know, the magnetic technology has less power requirements over time. Um, like I said, you have that 100 watts for seven seconds, and then you do have that constant 10 watts. But in comparison to a spring charge breaker, if you're doing uh, coil monitoring, which is very large in the market, that coil monitoring of a spring charge breaker will consume much more energy than it would the 10 watts that you would have to supply to, excuse me, the magnetic technology. Here is a basic breakdown of cost savings of magnetic technology over time versus a comparable spring charge uh, breaker, where you've got just you know ten breakers. How much how much time does it take to do your maintenance, um, you know, on that breaker mechanism? Normal uh, personnel you you usually have two or three personnel working together. Let's just say you have an average ra uh, rate 150. And then, you know, what's your projected life? Most with your projected life is 30 years with different types of maintenance and inspection cycles. So spring charge, a lot of people make it mandatory to do a one-year or two-year uh, on spring charge type mechanisms. Uh, but with the magnetic actuated technology, you know, your first five years, you, you don't even, you can be assured that you're not going to have to inspect that technology in any way, shape, or form. So people do the minimum of five years, which uh, for the AMVAC product line that I mentioned previously, we do have a standard five-year warranty. Um, so in terms of that, that gives you the additional cost savings. So if you were to buy that technology, here you get this technology with a, a five-year warranty right off the bat, but yet you wanted a five-year warranty with a spring charge type device, you're going to have to spend a little more money um, per breaker to get that uh, five-year warranty. Well, that additional cost can almost pay for an entirely new breaker. So you could instead, with the magnetic technology, have a spare breaker on site and have even you know, a better savings over time. Um, just to touch points on the AMVAC product line, and, and you know, we were referring to here, uh, the technology that we have, and we've seen, you know, we, we do constant increases, not just, you know, uh, in the technology, but looking at where we can improve the breaker overall. And in the past, we've, we've had things like this mechanical push button assembly, uh, which was in our older breakers. And the reason behind that was it was to meet a spring charged ANSI requirement. So the ANSI requirement uh, states that you have to have a breaker fully discharged before you remove it from the switch switch gear. Um, and this is referring to uh, spring charge, exposed springs in a spring charge mechanism. So older like air magnetic type breakers, the mechanisms were exposed. So when an operator would remove that breaker from a cell, you had the possibility of the operator getting injured if the breaker was still charged because it can cause a false operation and his finger could be somewhere in the mechanism and say cut a finger off. So the ANSI standard was written to protect the operators from this. Um, as technology of course has gone on into the vacuum interrupter type technology, even in the spring charge we've seen where the mechanisms have become enclosed 
But then, of course, we've added in now the magnetic type technology breakers. Well, originally, like I said, we thought we had to meet that standard where the breaker could not be charged during removal, but we found out later that we could remove this capacitor discharge circuit, which we had on this mechanical assembly, and go to the membrane type, and then just put a warning label on the front of the breaker saying, wait 10 minutes for the capacitor's discharge you know, when you remove the breaker from the cell. Um, normally by the time, it's actually by the time you've gotten the breaker out and the cover off, you know, 10 minutes is pretty much elapsed and the capacitors are at a safe value. It's just an, an extended amount of time just to ensure that you are safe in, to protect your operators. Um, we do offer this as a retrofit option for the older breakers and and then additionally, I was referring to how we, we've been changing our products. We look at customer requests and market requirements and do things such as changing the auxiliary contacts uh, to screw on terminal types. Also, additional improvements that we have done into our product line of the MVAC product is our racking mechanisms and the, you know, to improve the amount of force that the racking mechanism can handle before any type of failure is seen and just to try to increase the overall life of the product we we've, we've even gone in as far as to put uh, some brush bearing washers into the product which to extend the number of racking operations above and beyond the ANSI standard of 500 racking operations we've actually tested up to a thousand and this is shown here in the front channel of the the breaker where we've added in these uh, thrust bearings and these we have a what was it they oil impregnated bronze thrust bearing, which does not need any type of maintenance. So then just three basic configurations, just to touch on that product line that's offered, is the roll on the floor, the fixed mount, or a, re a standard draw out. Sometimes we get que questions as to, you know, what's the difference between a draw out and a roll on the floor. The roll on the floor has the large caster wheels, the draw out is is just without the wheels and the standard truck assembly. Um, and with fixed mount breakers, we do offer, you know, it comes standard with a five foot harness that are, that's plugged at the end. This, this allows for easy integration for customer use. And just to recap a little bit, um, now I had briefly mentioned about capacitive switching of the breaker. And then get back to what is a circuit breaker? You know, it's really meant to break a fault. So its KA rating is its primary purpose. A capacitive switch rating is kind of like a secondary rating of a circuit breaker and its abilities. Um, so in the standards, you know, we, we've done some harmonization where we've gone to the C1, C2, and C0. Well, C0 really isn't actually in the standard, but some people will utilize that uh, saying that that applies to breakers that haven't had capacitive switching because you don't know what the restrike performance is. Uh, restriking performance is very crucial when it comes to capacitor, capacitor bank switching because you don't want TRVs in your system. The TRVs can cause damage and degradation to your capacitor life. It can cause damages to your reactors and cause uh, ultimately system failures and blackouts. But what is in the capacitive switch rating of the breaker? Now well, you'll see that some some manufacturers will give a complete rating. Some people will just say C2. Um, so if you had a complete rating in front of you, you know, the, like a 10,000 30 amp C2 18 kA 2.4 kHz or the 1770 C1, you know, what does that really mean um, in terms of how do you apply that breaker? So this really only applies during normal capacitive bank switching, not necessarily during the fault conditions. Um, we've seen where some people have been using this as a limitating value during a fault condition uh, calculation, and it's not. Um, it is the performance uh, from the cap bank to the system. So the 10, the 10, excuse me, <clears throat> The 1,030 amps is seen as the, the amperage that is done, and it can't. It's, and it's not a limitation that the breaker can't handle something higher. Of course, it can handle something higher. It, if you have like a 1,200 amp, 2,000 amp, or 3,000 amp breaker, it can't handle that. But it may 
you may see a if you have an inrush higher than this that during a normal system operation, let me be very specific and not a fault operation, um, that you could have a restrike, the possibility of a restrike. Um, and then you have the 18KA inrush current. Now this is something that is just seen, that is that was observed during testing. It really has no bearing on your system design criteria, as well as the frequency that is provided with that KA. And and the reason being to that is what is stated in the standard. So now if you have the C2 rating, it doesn't guarantee that you won't have a restrike or pre-strike. You will. The event will will happen. It can happen. And it actually I've seen where some spring charge breakers will slow down over time. Um, the mechanisms themselves will wear out. And this kind of problem in in uh, spring charge breakers will increase your probability of having a restrike. Whereas with your, mech, your uh, magnetic type technology, uh, the actuation of the breaker does not change over time. Um, that aforementioned rating, which came from a 15 kV, 50 kA breaker, which is tested under uh, C3704, uh, giving a very low probability, is for inrush currents up to 6,000 amps, 600 hertz. So even though you have the, the 18K, 2.4K hertz on the rating, that's not really the limitation that you should be looking at if you're doing the, the calculations. Um, it's these inrush currents that are provided under the ANSI standard. Um, if, if the breaker is rated to a thir true 3704, and that concludes most of my talk here about uh, the magnetic technology in terms of medium voltage circuit breakers. Uh, additionally, I've added in a medium voltage device that uses a newer type of magnetic type technology. Um, so if you'd like to stay on here for a little bit longer, I would like to present to you the diode switch, and specifically, it is a switch for capacitive switching. Um, whereas I was talking about with the circuit breakers, you know, that, that is the secondary rating of a circuit breaker. The primary reason for a circuit breaker is to break under fault. So why use a circuit breaker as a switch? In some application, it may be acceptable to do that, and you know, even though you, you're acceptable wears onto that circuit breaker. But if you do a lot of capacitive switching, you're going to wear out the breaker. You're going to be performing more maintenance on, you know, especially spring charge type breakers. Uh, magnetic technology breakers such as the AMBAC and, and VM1 and stuff like that, you know, you'll never do the maintenance on the mechanism itself, and those breakers will go all the way up to, you know, the 20, 30,000 operational range of the vacuum interrupter. Uh, before needing replacement without any maintenance. But okay, just really quickly here, let me go ahead and ooh, you know what I realized was that the video will probably not show the audio here. What's happened? Kathy, are you on? I am. Can you get the video from the the, the video to play? The opportunity, the audio from the video to play. Mm, no, okay. there's nothing I can do with that. Okay, we didn't uh, didn't plan for that. Okay, I'll just go ahead and skip over this. So real quick, I'll talk about this device. Sorry, I had a video to show you, um, and we're doing audio from a, a cell phone, and it's not coming specifically through the presentation. So we can uh, just, if you'd like to see the video, it is online at abb.com. If you look up the DS1 uh, capacitor bank switch, um, you can watch the video off online, and it gives a lot of good information about the operation of the device. Uh, I apologize for that. Uh, that was a little technical glitch we didn't plan for here. Um, so, the, you know, talking in reference again, you know, with the C2 rating, C1, C0, you know, you, you have these restrike probabilities um, 
which degrades the life of the capacitor bank. The DS1 capacitive load switch switch does not use vacuum technology. This is this this slide here is comparison to look at that versus vacuum technology. It actually has dry air insulated poles. Um, it uses a uh, a diode internal to the pole itself, a diode stack, and then it uses uh, a mechanism which is perfectly timed that only allows the diodes to conduct for half a cycle and then it's fully closed and once it's fully closed those diodes are bypassed and it's just like having a straight piece of bus bar from your you know cap bank into your system but it also does this at your zero crossings so all three phases work independently using a, a linear uh, motor controlled um, operation it has a built-in ACU which is similar to like an 82 board like in the magnetic breaker technology but the ACU is a step further because the actuators of the DS1 are actually uh, rotor, uh, excuse me, motors just like you would see in a robotic type device so it has a, a onboard brain that controls each phase independently at, at precision timing down to uh, 50 microseconds operation. The mechanical life of this device, we'll see uh, up to 50,000 operations. Uh, we've rated the, ten, the electrical life to 10,000 full capacity current operations. Uh, that's not to say we couldn't exceed it. We haven't tested beyond that. Um, there's still a device that is with, excuse me, within testing. Um, the short time with stand current, a lot of people see as a limiting factor because it says only 20 kA at half a second. That can be calculated for a higher kA at a shorter duration according to the ANSI standard. But, you know, it's a capacitive switch. You would see this device in your capacitor bank feeding your banks into your system rather than having a circuit breaker there uh, to do the job. You would have this device, in which case in the cap bank you always have fuses that will react much quicker than half a second providing protection of the device. We have the device in operation on 50 kA systems and fuses in line with the capacitive switch for protection in the capacitor bank because you have to protect your capacitors anyways. Um, so to talk about just uh, the basics, a lot of this is covered in the video, and I do apologize again for not being able to show that, which would show, which shows the complete breakdown of the system and how it operates uh, internally. So it is a transient-free pre-strike and restrike. So you, you have no possibility of transients into your system whatsoever uh, it, because of the control mechanisms of this technology. And you can see here in this slide on the bottom part, you can actually see the three independent phases. There is the ACU, which is the onboard computer that has full diagnostic testing of the motors. Um, the motors constantly do the, they do what we call a little jiggle test, where it will literally feel if there's any uh, torque changes within the control system of the device itself. So it knows that something's going to go wrong before it goes wrong, because it measures the torque during its opening and closing operations. And if that torque goes without goes outside of a predefined range high or low it can it can tell the ACU that something either is wearing out or something is breaking and this is actually translated out to dry output contact similar like you see in the magnetic actuated technology breaker and so we have a status that says that there is something go wrong please do maintenance Just a quick overview of the system itself, like I was talking about. Sorry, again, <laughs> I wish the video had shown you. I, I kind of lost my place without it. Uh, so it is a very simple type device. Uh, we say it's green because it's dry air inside the poles of the device, um, and, and it is complete transient free. The, in, the integrated control device, the ACU, as I was referring to, provides all your synchronization, your actuation, and your diagnostics. It does actually monitor um, also the voltage on the bus. So you do have a separate voltage sensor, and that voltage sensor is following the, the, uh, the voltage on the bus so that it knows when the voltage is and current are at uh, the zero crossing. 
and therefore it does its operation. Um, and of course, you know, to have the full, to have a true zero crossing operation, all three phases have to be in pendant. So when you send an operation, say, to open, um, and phase A opens, you know, phases B and C will go 180 degrees out of phase, therefore A and C have to open together simultaneously. Now we say it's a small footprint save space savings, of course, because with the DS1 and this zero crossing that I'm referring to, um, you're able to remove your inrush reactors out of the cat bank and limit the outrush reactors outside of the cat bank uh, for requirements of uh, fault problem, fault, excuse me, fault calculations. Now we do have some examples that we can provide, and if if needed uh, for integration and you're looking to integrate this in your system, uh, we, are, we are willing to be very helpful and, and do some of the calculations, show you how to integrate it, and even show you, you know, what kind of cost savings that you could see in the future. Uh, here is an example of a customer who came to us and wanted to integrate the DS1 into their system. Um, so we looked at the calculations that they had already done uh, for their cat banks, and they were originally going to use here on the bottom, they had circuit breakers already in the system design. And so when we took those breakers out and we added in the DS1, we were able to also remove the uh, reactors internal to the capacitor bank and reduce the, the size of the reactors that were on the out there, uh, excuse me, outside of the bank for outrush currents during fault conditions. This gave us some overall savings versus that vacuum interrupter. Uh, first, of course, being the size of the reactors. Now, reactors are not very expensive um, by large and you know by manner, and the maintenance isn't isn't very extreme. But you have power losses over time, and those power losses uh, can can lead up to a significant amount. But also, because you're using a vacuum circuit breaker to do the job of a switch, a vacuum circuit breaker can induce transients into the systems. So then you can have a decreased life of your capacitors. You could also have a decreased life of your reactors. And then, so eventually end up with a, a blackout, uh, which originally is why this device was developed. Um, the DS1 that you see in the, the photos and you'll see in the video if you watch that, is actually the second generation of this device. Uh, the first generation was a lot of uh, research and development that took us several years, and the present device that we're present that we've released to the market now has been in operation for several years in the pilot installation alone. And this device is, has operated flawlessly from day one still until today. Uh, and like I said, it's the second generation. A lot of people say, well, we don't want a first generation type device. We don't want the first of anything. And this device now has is, is been in the market for quite some time, being used by a major utility. So the overall cost savings are very significant over time. Just like we talk about with the magnetic technology of the breaker. You know, initially you will sit, you spend a little bit more up front, but in the long term, through maintenance and downtime, you will save more money than you. So the initial investment gives you that long-term savings. So just a quick little overview of, say, the DS1 versus different types of technologies. Um, with the inrush current, you see on today's market, let's say you have no dampening in your system, you'll have this high you know, inrush current due to a regular switching event of a vacuum circuit breaker, or you, you know, utilize a relay or whatnot to provide synchronous vacuum um, switching, which in case you will still see uh, high transients into your system. And then additionally, people will add in pre-insertion resistors to decrease their transients, but still it's not a very significant decrease versus the DOS1 switch, these are your actual inrush currents, your voltages, you have no transients whatsoever. And then there's a thyristor, of course, which is another uh, type of device operated or uh, offered onto the market for um, switching. Uh, thyristors are, you know, pretty much like having a, a trans large transistor on the system. Um, but the downside to that is they're very large. They, they have power losses, they're oil cooled. 
you know, um, they do require periodic testing. Um, and and I, like I said previously, the DS1, you you have no testing, you have no maintenance, you actually have, you know, it it has maintenance prediction um, intelligence built into it, so it tells you before something will go wrong in the device. Um, for these uh, thyristors, you have limited number of daily operations. It's a device that can't stay closed in for a long period of time because of the heat losses that are generated during the conduction phases. Um, and like I said, they're they're pretty large in size in some cases. So I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. I apologize again for not being able to get that video. I'll have to work out the uh, technical details to, to do that next time. But uh, I hope everybody has a good day, and thank you again. Um, okay. Mike, you've got a few questions. Um, sure. We'll run through them here. Can you comment on the use of the magnetron atmospheric testing of vacuum interrupters? Um, the magnet, no, I will not comment on that. That is actually, you know, utilizing a device that is offered by another competitor. I mean, for, for a, the medium voltage indoor circuit breaker, it's not really something that we see any need or requirement for. Um, by, by the test that I had spoke about previously, um, you know, doing your AC withstand test for your vacuum integrity, and then doing your contact resistance tests, we have never seen any need to utilize the magnetron um, in you know the what, in the environment once it gets once the breaker gets out into the market. We do have the testing that is done on the vacuum interrupters in production prior to shipment, which is above and beyond, of course, just doing an AC withstand test and uh, contact resistance by next year. 2017, 100% of all ABB vacuum interrupters will be X-ray inspected. Um, previously, we've only been doing qual you know, uh, periodic quality checks using a X-ray, but uh, we will ensure that you know the product in its lifetime would never need such an inspection. Okay. Next question: What is the life expectancy of the capacitors? Well. I, we've we've touched that uh, where I did the 25 year calculation, you know, so uh, I think I've already spoke about the the life of the capacitors there. All right. Does the AMVAC have a manual trip device? Yes, the man the uh, magnetic technology breakers. We do have a manual trip. It is it's like a big T bar that on top of the actuator itself. Um, there's a little rotary port. Um, you stick this bar in there, and you slowly turn it, and there's a spring on the bar that starts to charge. So you just slowly keep turning it, and you'll feel the resistance of that spring. And once you hit a certain point, it'll pop the actuator open. All right. Does ABB have a magnetic actuated breaker specifically for electric arc furnace applications? <laughs> I uh, will have to refrain from answering that question at this point in time and uh, ask you to get back to me uh, at the end of the year. Okay. Um, my question relates to installed base. How many of these breakers are installed around the U.S.? What, if any, large customers have standardized on our magnetically actuated breakers? Um, we do have a very large installed base. Uh, in the U.S., we sell. You know, let me remember this off the top of my head. I know we we sell approximately you know 1,500 uh, AMVACs per year, just AMVACs now. Um, when when I say just AMVAC, I re I'm referring to the, our standard switch gear offering, and I'm not referring to the roll and replacement, the R AMVAC, which we do. Uh, provide many of, and also the RMAG technology, which is the outdoor circuit breaker version of the AMVAC. Um, those numbers combined, I do not have uh, all together, but if I was to guesstimate, I could easily estimate between 20 to 50,000 um, in in the U.S. If, if combined of all magnetic technology breakers. The magnetic technology, like I said, has been offered since the late 90s. Um, 
and then into the ANSI market in the early 2000s. So, okay, what's the next one? All right, uh, let's see. I have two more questions that are kind of related. First is, what is the voltage rating of the DS1? And the second is, what is the maximum current rating for the DS1? Um, the voltage rating, we, we have it both for IEC and ANSI. Uh, ANSI being the 15 kV voltage class and the IEC being 17 kV voltage class um, at uh, 630 amps. Which is usually around your your 10 and uh, excuse me 10 MVA. Or I think I go back to those slides here. Oops. Just before I quote myself wrong. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh. Yeah, 630 amps at the 17 and a half kV level and 600 amps at the 15 kV level. All right, it looks like those are all of the questions we've had submitted online. Um, again, if anyone has any questions they think of after the webinar is over, Mike's contact information is in there. Feel free to call him, give him an email. Um, and, and he'll be happy to follow up with you. If you are on the webinar, everyone will receive an email uh, sometime this afternoon with a link to the recording of this webinar, so you'll have access to all this information as well as Mike's contact information. So uh, with that being said, um, unless you have anything else to add, Mike, um, I thank you for attending, and this is the conclusion of the webinar. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day.